morning everyone and a very warm welcome. Please have a seat as long as you find one. And if you don't find a seat, just please join us for today's event. Um, welcome again to Académie der Künste for the finissage day of the exhibition The Great Repair. My name is Johanna Keller. I'm head of the programming department uh, here at Académie der Künste and very pleased um, to welcome you and to share the next few hours with you. Um, it is the last day of the exhibition The Great Repair um, that Akademie der Künste presents together uh, with our partners, uh, Arch Plus, led by uh, Akademie der Künste member Anne Lino, uh, and other partner institutions. Um, it was intense weeks um, and we now have a final day to again come together and discuss the topic of the exhibition that invites us to imagine a future towards transform transformation for a society of repair. And how do we do that? Um, for that, we need an exchange of practices um, and uh, to explore the possibilities of systemic change. You see a lot of these practical examples in the exhibition. Um, and one of the examples is also the work by Mille Ladam and Euclid, um, with the title Touch Sanitation who joined the exhibition upon invitation by curator Bettina Knaup and whose work you can see right at the entrance of the exhibition when you come uh, to the uh, exhibition rooms upstairs. Uh, Mille Ladam and Euclid has contributed um, in a pioneering way um, to uh, f forming an art practice dealing with everyday care work. Um, she is a pioneering artist in that context and will be speaking to the Berlin audience for the first time today. We are very happy um, to have her on screen uh, with us. She is joined by scholar Lisa Bareitza, uh, who joined us from London. So thanks Lisa for being here and also for joining the talk. Uh, and both will be introduced uh, more thoroughly uh, later. Um, what remains for me to be said is that I'm very grateful for everyone, uh, Mele, Lisa, and curator Bettina Knaup um, for joining today's discussion. Bettina Knaup not only curated uh, Euclid's participation in the exhibition, but also today's event. And allow me to just introduce her briefly. Uh, she is a freelance curator and writer from Berlin. She has co-curated or curated numerous international festivals, exhibitions, and projects. And among them particularly is the project React Feminism. Uh, and the Akademie der Künste back then was also a partner in that project. So several events took place here in that very building. The project React Feminism then toured Europe from 2008 until 2013 and has been relaunched in the context of Manifesta 14 in Pristina uh, just uh, last year or in 2022. Um, Bettina Knapp recently uh, completed her a PhD, uh, which deals with performing as waste. And based on that work, she is now currently preparing a collaborative artistic project engaging with waste infrastructures. So we will probably hear from her again soon. And before leaving the floor to you, Bettina and Lisa and Mirle, uh, I invite you to join us also for the rest of the day. Of course, you will have to, the chance to see the exhibition until it closes at 7. PM. Uh, there will be two more events today in the afternoon and then the exhibition will close this evening but we have another event next week, next Saturday, which will take place in the other building of Akademie der Künste at Pariser Platz. Um, it's called a symposium, a day-long symposium uh, with the title Reparations and Repair on Climate Justice, Colonialism and the Capitalocene. And there we will discuss what reparations actually mean in the context of climate justice. So I hope to see you again next week and now wish you a very fruitful talk and hand over to Bettina. Thank you. Okay, I hope yeah, the mic works. Thank you, um, Johanna, and um, thank you, Akademie der Künste, for making this um, project now and this event here possible today. Um, <clears throat> And I'm, of course, also very excited and honored to have the opportunity to welcome you and our guests, uh, Merle ledeman Yukelis and Lisa Bereitza, who's here in front. And maybe we can see Merle. Hello, Merle. Yeah. You're there. So, um, <laughs> um, so 
So, and of course, I'm also very happy um, that you all made your way here on a Sunday rainy morning um, to this event, which we entitled Touching Maintenance. Um, <clears throat> let me first introduce our speakers. Um, since the late 1960s, Merle Lederman Ukelis has foregrounded the life-sustaining value of everyday maintenance work. Um, most importantly, I think, in the uh, Manifesto for Maintenance Art um, proposal for an exhibition care that you can see enlarged um, in the exhibition. She has worked with countless maintenance workers with their materials and with it within their infrastructures, creating performances, exhibitions, sculptures, building-wide installations, city-wide work ballets, as well as sound and video works. Since 1977, um, she has been the unsalaried artist in residence at the New York City Department of Sanitation, a position she holds until today. <laughs> Represented by Ronald Feldman Gallery in New York City, she exhibits and lectures internationally. She has received several honorary doctorates and her works are in the permanent collections of many museums worldwide. Um, Lisa Bereitzer, who is here in front, and you will see her very soon, is professor of psychosocial theory at Birkbeck University of London. Her research brings psychoanalytic and social theory together to address the temporal, ethical, and affective dimensions of care. She's the author of Maternal Encounters, The Ethics of Interruption in 2009, and Enduring Time, um, a book which has gathered stories and artistic practices um, and ex um, experiences of time not passing, of suspended time. Um, <clears throat> and in this context, she has written extensively about uh, Ukela's work. Um, from 2017 to 2023, um, she was the principal investigator on the research project Waiting Times that's, that investigated the relation between time and care in the UK Health Service, funded by the Wellcome Trust. She's also a member of the British Psychoanalytic Society and maintains a psychoanalytic practice in London. And thanks again, um, Lisa, to make the way uh, within your busy schedule here to Berlin. <laughs> You might wonder why we titled this event Touching Maintenance. The first reason for choosing this title is that long durational acts of excessive touch are a central element of many of Merle Ledermanukula's work, um, be it in her early cleaning performances, scrubbing museum floors uh, and streets, or in her large-scale collaborative performances and installations, personally shaking hands with large groups of people, actually with whole workforces, or touching huge flows of matter. Being in touch with degraded and discarded matters and people and practices is a central theme of her life work. In 1993, she wrote in relation to an installation called Blizzard of Agitated Materials in Flux, all human meaningful work comes through the laying on of hands onto material, adding, but I worry that while we do this, terrible numbing blankness is happening to our, our synapses addressing the intensity, the beauty maybe, but also the pain or horror of the correlationality and reversibility of touching and being touched, which blurs the boundaries of the self. Secondly, this encounter and, and event is also an um, occasion to be in touch again, to revisit a life work that has touched and influenced so many of us, including Lisa Bereitzer's work on suspended temporality and care, and my own practice of curating and writing in relation to waste and performance. So I hope that we will all together here touch upon and be touched again by Merle lederman Yukulus' long duration of practice of maintenance. And maybe one more word to the reason why we put this event, which has been long in planning, as you might know, and which, of course, we have um, hoped to um, be here all together in presence, um, why we have suggested to hold this event at the end of the exhibition, uh, The Great Repair. And the main reason is that um, Mal's work proposes maintenance art essentially as, and I'm quoting here, um, her master thesis from 1974 as a methodology of continuing and continue again and continue again and continue again and continue again. And also Lisa's work, uh, Lisa writes extensively about modes of caring without end. So somehow it's a proposal to um, escape the notion of ending. 
and um, maybe there's a slight difference also between repair and maintenance uh, which of course are really related in many many ways um, and also coincide and are both very necessary but also there's a difference which i think lies, lies especially in the temporality while repair of objects, be it objects of daily use, technical equipment, buildings, or large-scale infrastructure sets in after damage, failure, or breakdown has occurred and continues, uh, and the continuous use is impossible. Um, and it aims somehow, therefore, at restoring use value and has, therefore, a limited or projected, even if contingent, time frame. Maintenance, however, is continuous, ongoing, durational practice. It is aimed at preventing decay and breakdown um, <clears throat> in relation to objects, infrastructures, but also in relation to bodies and lives. And maybe, as Heike Weber and, um, and others have outlined in their anthology, Cultures of Repair, maintenance is closer aligned with the intrinsic temporality of its objects, um, not least with maintaining as attending or as waiting, as the German term Wartung, the translation of maintenance Wartung implies, which stems from the same etymological root than Warten, waiting. Merle has recently ended a lecture with the following words. Who cares? How long do we have? Do we have to take care for forever? Yes, we have. And with this, I want to um, hand over to Merle and before doing so, just thanking once more Akademie der Künste, Johanna Keller and Lina Brion, who envision, enable and oversee the planning of this event, to the technical team who make sure we co-inhabit this space with Merle. Um, <clears throat> and my thanks also goes, of course, to the Art Plus team who hosts the work of Euclid in their wonderful exhibition and this event in the frame of the exhibition Finissage. So, and of course, most of all now to our both speakers, Merle and Lisa, who are prepared on a Sunday morning to share their time, their thoughts and their imagination with us. And with this, I hand over to Merle. Hi. Hi. I am so honored to be part of this great repair project. Uh, I'll speak about it more later. <clears throat> Manifesto for Maintenance Art, 1969, Proposal for an Exhibition Care. Next. I became an artist to be free to win the levels of freedoms that I received from my Western culture artist heroes. Freedom to act within the artwork from my Uncle Jackson Pollock. Freedom to name and rename from my grandfather Marcel Duchamp. Freedom to pass from one dimension to another from my uncle, Mark Rothko. You might notice the genders. <laughs> I struggled for years to win this freedom as artist. Then in 1968, out of free choice, desire, and great blessing, we had a baby. I became a mother maintenance worker. I discovered that Jackson, Marcel, and Mark didn't change diapers. <laughs> I had fought so hard to get their freedoms, but I fell out of their picture. I was so powerful, giving life and keeping life alive, learning the hum of getting from one breath to the next and learning the mind-bending boredom of repetitive task work. At times, I felt as if my well-educated brain was going to blow out of the top of my head. <laughs> Goodbye, it was saying to me as I changed yet another diaper. <laughs> I wasn't made for this. There she was on the changing table, 
smiling and gurgling at me. I love this baby, madly, twirling. And I was discovering every teeny element of the external world with her as she discovered it. I was in a full crisis. I felt like two people in the same body, the free artist and the mother maintenance worker, twirling. I was never working so hard in my life, yet people who met me pushing my baby carriage would ask me, do you do anything? <laughs> falling, falling, twirling. Maintenance in 1968, no words, no language, no place, no culture. I was dumped outside Western culture. I was so angry and I felt so entitled too. I had had the best education in Western culture. I'm supposed to be powerful. Click, an honest to God epiphany. This became clear. If I am the boss of my freedom, then I name maintenance art. I can collide freedom into its opposite and make necessity art. Why? Because I am the artist and I say so. I, me, an artist, as artist, I must survive. It is art and art history that needs to change. Get in line. It all came to, together in one sitting when in a quiet rage, I wrote the manifesto for maintenance art in October, 1968. The manifesto was four pages. Next. It is a sculpture that is a text. It, provide, it proposes three streams that flow into each other. Personal maintenance, societal maintenance, especially in cities, work in cities, and earth maintenance. Next. My first job after this realization to re-see the whole world, to start all over again, like my baby, at the beginning. Please note, this is not the art of the happy cleaner. My ambivalence is extreme, twirling. The thing about an epiphany is that it is not serious, narrow. It is not narrow. It blazes. It radiates outward. I call necessity art. The manifesto is a world vision to take care and a call for revolution for all the workers of maintenance. These are the workers of survival. until now, and still now, yeah. been told. Can I interrupt you? Shortly, you have issues on your microphone. Is there anything, your papers above the microphone? We hear oh. it the whole time. Okay, sure. Better. I'll try. Tell me about this. Wonderful, thank you. Is that better? Wonderful. Christian, you're terrific, Christian. Okay. <laughs> Women, the ancient uninvited maintenance class who have forever, until now, and still now, been told, been murdered, are still told this is who you are. 
and together with non-gendered service workers, look around, that's most of the people in the whole world. Together, if organized, in coalition, we could reshape the world. The manifesto is a sculpture that is a text. It is four pages long. It has two parts. One, ideas. Two, proposal for the maintenance art exhibition care. I picture the exhibition care taking up a whole museum, all the floors. It has three parts, personal, society, and, and main earth maintenance, the planet. These three parts flow into one another. Personal, I live in the museum and take care of it. The working becomes the artwork. Floor two, general, society, the city, voices, interviews. What happens to your dreams when you have to spend all your time doing maintenance? What happens to your freedom? And three floors, three and four, earth maintenance. Every day, containers of degraded materials, earth, air, water, are delivered to the museum and brought inside and serviced. Next. The museum becomes the fulcrum of transformation. The manifesto in 1969 is a cultural mega shift, new to Western culture. It pictures a holistic view of the whole world. Maintenance is forever as long as we are here. Maintenance is universal. Care, the exhibition, hasn't happened yet, but a stream of works have flowed from the manifesto for decades. Here are a few of them. Next. The Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. Two days in July 1973, four performance works. An analysis of the institution that confers value in a culture from its maintenance underbelly up. The first piece is called Transfer of the Art Object, the maintenance of the art object. The performers are the triad in a museum that includes contemporary art. The maintenance worker the living artist, the conservator. I select a female mummy, 2,000 years old. I select her because she still has her breasts after all these years. I select the transparent cultural frame that at that point is not art, but is the declaration by the institution that value lies within. I select the glass vitrine. Next. First, the maintenance worker. He does his job. He cleans the vitrine. The museum uses diapers and Windex. These are his tools. He is the expert. He finishes. Next.
Next. Then he hands me his tools. Next. I make a dust painting on and of the vitrine. I copy the moves of the maintenance worker since he is the expert. Next. I am looking and wondering about this woman mummy as I make the dust painting. Next. I finish the painting, then I stamp the vitrine with my rubber stamp that says, quote, original maintenance artwork. I have exteriorized the art value to include not only the inside mummy, but also the vitrine. Because I am the artist, because I say so. Next. Now the maintenance of the artwork, the art object, can be done only by the conservator. He does a condition report and decides that this vitrine artwork is dirty and needs a cleaning. I hand the conservator my tools that I had received from the maintenance worker. Next. He copies the actions of the maintenance worker who can no longer, is not allowed to touch the artwork, the vitrine, art object. He completes his work and leaves a clean vitrine art object. Next. The triad, here we are, are, but what about the original expert, the maintenance worker? What's the deal? What is his value? Next. Washing. 1974, the sidewalk in Soho on Wooster Street in Manhattan, in front of the old AIR gallery, one of the first feminist galleries. I am in Lucy Lepard's, quote, C7500, a traveling exhibition between 1973 <coughs> and 1974, I bring old sheets from home. Next. I yell every hour on the hour, facing north, east, south, west. The cleanliness of this area is now being maintained as art from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. It will be normalized at 5.01 p.m. Next. I begin washing. Soho was still partially industrial then and much dirtier in 1974. Next. Next. Very dirty. <laughs> Next. Next. I am in trouble. Next. It is so dirty, I am running out of rags. The sidewalk 
is eating them up and I have a long time to go. Next. <coughs> the gift. A superintendent, the manager of a whole factory building from across the street, has been watching me and listening to me for some time. He sees that I am in trouble. He arrives. He doesn't ask, what is this? Why is this art? Instead, he walks right into my art, bringing me an armful of new tough rags and says, here. That is the only word that passed between us. He accepts me as real and enables me to keep working. I think from that point, the deal of my art changed, opening myself to become interdependent with others with a complimentary offer for them to participate in shaping the work, not simply to receive it. This idea became real at this moment. Next. I am so moved that I try to incorporate his gift into my body, wrapping his rags around and around to become my own foot and leg, wanting to turn my body, not just my hands, into a cleaning force. I become mop foot. He has entered my soul. Next. I can keep working. Next. I wipe the visitor's footsteps out. As soon as he enters the space, I trap him. <coughs> Maintenance can become fascism. Like when your mother says after she just cleaned the floor, if you get this dirty, I'll kill you. <laughs> Next. Next. I stand there facing two guys who even avoid coming into the territory that I have taken over. We stare at each other. This is 1974. These guys looked groovier than the super. They look artier. But from here on, I belong with the super. I am in a new world of maintenance with actually most of the people in the world trying to keep going. Next. I am invited to be an art arrow arrow both ways in, at the downtown Whitney. The museum itself is an, a long office space on the second floor of one of the biggest, fanciest off office skyscrapers in New York City. I've been looking for a skyscraper to make maintenance art for a long time. Hard to find. Here it is. I propose this performance work. I make maintenance one hour every day, not only inside the museum, but all over the huge building with all 300 workers who take care of it. Next. I write each worker a letter of invitation to participate in the performance, I give each worker a button 
to where if they decide to participate. I practically inhabit the building for the duration of the exhibition. I ask each worker I encounter all over the building to consider one hour of their regular maintenance work as art, if they choose. When I encounter a worker, I ask permission to photograph them at work. I take a Polaroid, I show them the image, and I ask, is this work or art? Whatever they say, I have a label with each choice, and I put their choice at the bottom of their photos. Then I mount them day by day in the museum on the second floor. Next. Here's Bruno, the best maintenance worker in the whole museum. The elevator opens stuffed with bags that Bruno has loaded to, to dump on the first floor in the back. He's a great balletic worker. I yell, the, the corridor is one block long. I yell, is this art? Hoping he'll say yes because he's great. <laughs> is this art a block away? It's work. It's always work. It's work. Next. I start the show with nothing but gridded white and blue paper on my 15 foot long piece of real estate that I get for the show. White for day work, blue for night work. At the opening, everyone else's work was complete. Mine was empty. Uh-oh, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. In this show is Gordon Mata Clark, Douglas Hubler, Agnes Dennis, Helena Newton Harrison. Next. Now you see the full wall with many, many decisions. Vanilla at 3 a.m. I've been waiting for you for weeks. The art is the transfer of power from artist to worker. As artist, I have the power of the gaze. I frame the image of the, of the work that I take but I hand over the power to name the decision to each worker. Next. By the end of this 1976 exhibition, there were 720 images and design decision choices, not by me, but by them. A lovely thing since most of the work was done by night workers, the Whitney responded to my request that there be a closing party for them at midnight. Next. Here is the completed work in October 1976. In 2018, it has now gone home to the mother. The main Whitney Museum acquired it for their permanent collection after their curators shied, saw it at my work uh, 50 years of work show at the Queen's Museum in 2016. Next. I thought with I Make Maintenance Art one hour every day, doing a performance with 300 workers 
was the most people that you could ever work with. After a great review of this work in the Village Voice, I sent it to the Commissioner of Sanitation. I get a call from Francis Richards, the Commissioner's Assistant. Hello, this is Francis Richards. I'm Commissioner Vaccarello's Assistant. How would you like to make art with 10,000 people? I'll be right over, I reply. <laughs> to me, this is the, the world's maintenance major leagues, the sanitation department. They're calling me up to the major leagues. Next. After one and a half years research, listening to and learning from sanitation workers, I begin the performance ritual. I will make 10 circling sweeps around New York City. I refuse to experience through sampling the abstract way a social scientist comes to know something. Only if I immerse myself in sanitation's wholeness can this art become real. I will float through the entire system's everyday reality to face all the workers, to travel to every sanitation facility in New York City, the whole system. I decide to make art utterly public art injected into the city's bloodstream. Next. I will face each of 8,500 sanitation workers, shake hands and say to each person, thank you for keeping New York City alive. Next, every day I go out a telex, that's what preceded the internet. A telex is sent from headquarters to every sanitation location so people can track me all over town throughout the performance. <coughs> Next. <coughs> I spend at least an eight hour, often a 16 hour shift, modeling my performance art time on their eight hour work shift, making increasingly fiery speeches at roll call. I'm not here to watch you, to study you, to judge you. I am here to be with you, all the shifts, to walk out the city with you, to thank you. <coughs> this is the South Bronx. I'm really scared and they look really dubious. This is the second day of touch sanitation. Next. Then I walk out some of the thousands of curb miles with the Sandmen at that time still an all-male workforce. This is a garage in Brooklyn. No showers that work, doors, that, toilets that don't have doors, broken sinks, holes in the roof. Next. We eat together, sometimes on the curb, because many restaurants won't, for, won't serve salmon inside, often in pretty miserable section stations. Here's one in Queens. Much of the time, I listen. They have a very strong union. And when they go bargain for their salaries, 
They go in with the police and fire. They're a fearsome trio. But the conditions of maintenance aren't on their list. Next. It is risky and possibly dangerous. As Robert Smithson would call it, this expedition, exploration, is a, quote, taboo situation. Next. Next. It is also thrilling. Next. Next. But there is fury and fear in the garages and locker rooms. New York City has a huge fiscal crisis, almost going bankrupt. Maybe a move is afoot to sell sanitation department to private carter companies. The city's workforce is reduced by 60,000 workers. It is that bad. Every day I face strangers. Often they are shouting. It's scary. But I am fueled by my own personal fury as a mother maintenance worker at how maintenance workers, both women as, quote, the destined, and sanitation workers, keepers of the exterior city as home, are not seen, not heard, not honored. That's it. We are joined in being pissed off. I'm trying to create a grand coalition, a service workers coalition. That's most of the people in the world. It's time to rupture this whole ancient, ridiculous bubble. Next. This gets complicated. It's 6 a.m. roll call again. I'm in Staten Island. Do you know why everyone hates us? Many ask me. Why? They think we're their mother. <laughs> they think we're their maid. Oh, as if it were obvious. If they were women, would it be okay to hate them? Would it? Who are they telling this to? Surely this feminist artwork aiming to build the ultimate inside-outside coalition needs more work. Next. I meet a sanitation worker. I see deep in his eyes what I have come to call the gates of acceptance. I see him looking at me, and then I see his gates opening up. He has decided, what the hell, I will trust her. I will tell her what it does to me inside when people think we are part of the garbage. Next. I feel at home. He fully intends for me to pass this along to others as an artwork. Next. Follow in your footsteps a part of the performance that just popped up and grew along the way. I copy their moves out on the street 
to place myself in the same position of public exposure. I also like it because it often cracks them up. Next. A dance develops. Next. Next. We're dancing in the street. This is the beginning of what turned into seven work ballets with workers who are everywhere, if we want to stay, all over the world. Next. It continues to all the sites of degraded land. Next. I thought the performance itself would take three months. It ends up taking 11 months, from July 24, 1979 to June 26, 1980. It is hard on my own family. My seven-year-old son comes home from school after catching hell from his friends. He asks me, are there many? garbage artists like you. <laughs> now, he's 53 years old. I asked him the other day how he responded to the, kids, the kid who said, your mother's a garbage artist. <laughs> he told me, I didn't say anything. I slugged him. <laughs> Next. Every day I send out a telex saying where I will be to touch sanitation so people all over town know how far I've come. It's 3 a.m., 10 months since I started. I arrive at a dank little godforsaken section office in the Bronx. I ask myself, I'm so tired. What am I doing this for? Then the foreman says, I've been tracking you all year. I have said I'm going to do this, and they have been mapping me, doing it all over the city. I don't run away. I keep coming back, just like they do. That's what binds us. That is our power. A human being always has the freedom to say no. Next. But a human being also has the freedom to say yes. Open your hand. The art is to create a dismapping of the formal city and to create a remapping of the entire living city from its underbelly up. The allness of it, only via the ineffable individuality of every worker, with everyone, with whom we are utterly dependent, now inside the picture. This is the beginning of democratic public culture. Next. It's 42. Uh oh. Okay, we've hit 42 minutes. Out of 50, um, I'm going to run through uh, the slides. I want you to see the images, even if I can't tell you all the stories, but I have to tell you this story. I'm standing in the landfill in Brooklyn. I meet a sanitation worker. We shake hands. I say thank you for keeping New York City alive. He says, can I tell you a story? Sure. 17 years ago, it was very hot. We stopped for break and sat down on some lady's porch. The lady comes out the door of her house and she says, after we had loaded her garbage, 
Get away from here, you smelly garbage men. I don't want you stinking up my porch. Then he says, that's stuck in my throat all these years, 17 years. Today, you wipe that out. That was the best thing anybody ever said to me as an artist. But then he says to me, will you remember that next? Next. Here we are, after the story. Next. This is the word going out from headquarters. Send us your the, all the names, bad names you've been called on the streets. Next. Next. To remember that story. I rebuilt the ladies' porch on the steps of the entrance of the Feldman Gallery in Soho. The Department of Sanitation built two levels of scaffolding along 75 feet of glass, and the preparators from the gallery painted the bad names all over the glass. I invited 190 people from all sectors of society to wash off the bad names. Here I am, beginning the performance by retelling the story. The street was closed and many people, next, many people witnessed the cleansing ceremony. Many sanitation workers and officials were in the audience, seated, watching, with many tears flowing. Art could make bad stories come out right. Next. Next. Okay, now we're gonna move along pretty fast, as fast as I can. This is Snow Workers Ballet in 2012, Echigo Tsumari. Next, please. The Echigo Tsumari Triennial. This town, Tokomachi, has an average of four meters of snow annually, some of the highest snowfalls in the world. It is the snow workers who dig out, dig them, literally dig them out of the snow. The first floors of towns are covered in snow. They can only live there because of the daring work that the, that the snow workers do. I refuse to send them a choreography in advance. I say we'll do it together. Next, these are drawings from the ballet. Here's one of the drawings. Next. Three of the workers with their mighty rotary machines. Next, the dance of the rotaries and the audience. Next, these are a few images from the love story of Romeo and Juliet, the tragic love story. The young lovers approach each other tenderly they are thrilled with each other, even though their families hate each other. They proclaim their love unafraid. Next. Next. They kiss. This is actually a very dangerous move. If not done exquisitely, they will topple each other over. Ecstasy before doom. Next. 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 I hear a lady behind me saying, this is so emotional. <laughs> Next, I want to bring the audience to the workers. 
People say they won't come. Japanese people are shy. So I walked up and down the path that separated them, and I just gestured, come, come. They joined each other. Okay. Next, next project. Landing, landing. This is my project, go ongoing since 2008. I still need to raise quite a, quite a bit of money. This is Fresh Kills Landfill, the largest municipal landfill on earth, 2,200 acres, 300, almost three central parks in size. I can talk about this later. We're gonna to have to just move through it. Next. After almost 50 years of operating and dumping 150 million tons of garbage. Uh, the completion the, of the environmental engineering closure has been completed. The mounds are covered with geosynthetic plastic that doesn't allow garbage uh, decomposition to continue. Next. Next. There's a tragic layer at Fresh Kills. The remains of 9-11 terror attack that destroyed the two World Trade Centers and killed 2,977 people in one day. The remains are buried in a special site on the west mound of Fresh Kills. Now is the time to shift to turning Fresh Kills into a healthy public park. Next. Please ask me about this later. This is my site. Next. I'm standing in front of this site um, on the land bridge between two mounds of South Park there will be a cantilevered overlook, 62 feet, so that you walk out into the space of the transformed landfill, looking down at the ancient wetlands and ahead at the transformation of a one mile long, very degraded site. Next. Proposal for one million people to participate in an artwork for Fresh Kills Park. Redeeming this land stuffed with material rejections redeemed by those who made it, individual by individual. This is a social sculpture that we all made together. Please ask me about this also. Even though you're in Staten Island, next, you're standing on all the other boroughs of New York that raised the mounds to become a social sculpture that we all made together. Next, how does a place switch its meaning and become something else? Next. Next, next, oh, I guess it's, people are invited to make something of value that will be released but not rejected, that will be given into community. It will be released but doesn't lose its value. Next. I believe the site cannot be transformed into something else and it already is becoming beautiful unless many of us who made it actively and personally attempt to renew it. How many? It needs a kind of scale of the original size of 2,200 acres. I propose a million, a million 
donors who create something of personal value that they release without rejection. Next. Next. Workshops will be established in museums. Next. And in other cultural transfer stations, other cultural sites, such as sanitation section themselves, facilities. The donor releases the offering to the city. The city, next. Next. The city re re receives it. It is through transfer and exchange. And it is given a unique barcode that the, that the donor says what the value is. Here is an example of an embedded offering. Next. A million offerings will become edges of paths, about 50 million, 50 miles of paths and vertical surfaces along, around the whole site. Thus it is the people who originally made this land through acts of material rejection and separation who can renew this land for themselves and for all of us into the future. The new permanent citywide land layer, kissing the surface, now entering the public domain, will be a huge flow force, revealing a new kind of reverence for this place. Next. For Forever, a three-part work during COVID. One part is a Times Square, a huge high screen with emergency snow orange color filling the screen, followed by a message. Next. Next. Dear service worker, thank you for keeping New York City alive. Followed by another color, full screen. Next, sorry. That's one third. The second third is in 25 hundred screens throughout the subway system. Next. Same message. Next. 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 And the third part in front of the Queen's Museum. Who cares? How long do we have to care for forever? Um, you know what, just, I'm gonna just say next, next. I won't explain, you can ask me about it. <laughs> Time to wrap it up. <laughs> this is an image flow. Okay, next. 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 One year's work time. I hope this would become the exterior of a sanitation garage. Every eight hour work shift in an entire year. You're seeing a year of work. Next. <coughs> Next. Next. This is ceremonial arch, a source image from Cartier-Bresson. A ceremonial arch, next. 
honoring service workers. Here's where I stiffened 5,000 work gloves from 11 agencies in, a, in the central repair shop of sanitation. Next, <coughs> here's the arch. Next, and it's six columns. Next, next, next. Fifty work lights pulsing, five thousand work gloves signed and tagged. Next, next. Peace table and peace talks. This is the source image of peace I did at LA MOCA, 540 tons of recycled glass and a glass peace table. Next. Here's the peace table at my 50 year career survey show at the Queens Museum for people and for peace talks. <coughs> Next. <coughs> this is a peace talk between managers of building, individual buildings who have to, are responsible to put out the recyclables and managers, supervisors from the sanitation department responsible to pick them up. They had never spoken to each other before, but they're married to each other. Here they talked because the museum can make that happen. Next. And the final of many peace talks uh, called Care is Culture with many, many artists. Next. And finally, the social mirror, my garbage truck covered with tempered glass. Um, a real garbage truck used in public events and parades. This is in the back of the museum. Next. The social mirror meets the ice cream truck. Next. And the final image, the social mirror in front of the Unisphere in the park behind the museum. Thank you. I owe you 10 minutes, but you know. <laughs> Mal, thank you so very much. It was really wonderful and fantastic and great to hear you. Uh, elaborating the stories and the development of your various projects in a flow rather than considering them as isolated um, fractured projects um, and also to notice I mean I'm aware of this but to notice them beside all the fantastic realized projects you did um, to also notice the many 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 uh, proposals you have made over um, the decades that are still waiting for their realization yes. and your insistence to really go on and persist. And um, yeah, it's really wonderful to hear you. So before we enter a discussion altogether, uh, I would like to ask now Lisa uh, Bereitza to um, come here on stage and she will give uh, her presentation response to Mel's work and then we will all come together and discuss together. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. First of all, I'm just delighted to be here. Um, I want to start with my thanks to Mel, really for her life work and her methodology of continuing. I want to say thank you to Bettina for the very kind invitation to speak and for her work on the performance of waste, which I hope we'll get to 
I want to thank Johanna and the Academy der Kunst and Lina Brion for a very expert uh, organisation and to this fantastic team of people who are managing to make this work so well. Second thing is apologies for those three or four people in the audience who've read a book called Enduring Time. I just want to apologise that I'll be drawing from that work and it'll be very familiar to you. So you can kick back and have a rest now. And for those people who don't know that work, then I'll take you through some of it. I want to start with the context of this talk, this finissage, is that the right word, for the exhibition, The Great Repair, so the context that is of retouching Merle Dominicelli's work, the work touch sanitation that's upstairs and the manifesto that's on the wall. So I want to start then with the question of repair. And I approach this as an open question or a possible that Isabel Stengers gives us this, this notion. For Stengers, in the face of the various global catastrophes that confront us, the current task is to take care of the possible. Where the effects of experiments, we can think of social experiments, political experiments, clinical, artistic experiments, as much as scientific ones, cannot be known in advance. If we instrumentalize repair, rather than take care of its possibles, we fail to see that care, that, sorry, that repair and violence are always bound up together, and that damage and repair then simply repeat in an endless cycle. So this is an insight that's drawn from Kleinian psychoanalysis that describes the ways we find ourselves in psychic life damaging the very things we depend on and have to both come to care about and also repair if we are to survive the vicissitudes of having a mind. So one move that I make towards care of the possible is to approach repair as a temporal rather than a material experiment. To repair from the Latin reparare is to make good again that which was made ready, parare, but not necessarily to restore it to the state it was before. As something is made ready again, it is repaired it is orientated differently towards the new possible. In this sense, repair is a particular form of care, care of the possible, that is retroactive or après coup. So doing something again doesn't just reconstitute, but it constitutes for the first time a relation between making ready and an anticipated future that remains unknowable in advance. So to repair entails risk and uncertainty in the face of unprecedented destruction. Yet the again in repair points us towards the temporalities of repetition and return. So these historically unglamorous, arduous, often seen, unseen labor of maintenance that is raced, that is abled, that is classed, that is gendered, and concerns enduring and sustaining the stuck time of going over and over the same things, in Ukele's words, which Bettina also quotes in her work, continue again and continue again and continue again and continue again. So a little bit of theory. In my work, I've linked that process to what I've called the maternal death drive, reworking Freud's notion of the haunting of the subject and the social world by destructiveness to open up the possibilities of repetition on the side of life that is linked to Hannah Arendt's notion of natality or beginning again as the ground of politics. So Freud's concern is concerned with the repetition compulsion, so our need to go over and over the same ground to try to master a situation in the face of trauma. And this gives rise to his articulation of the death drive as a kind of repetitive return to a state of non-being. Whereas for me, the maternal death drive supplements Freud's death drive. Sorry, I've just lost my place. Yeah, by accounting for repetition that retains a relation to the developmental time of life but remains otherwise or different from a life drive. So the temporal form that this life in death 
takes is the form of dy dynamic chronicity, analogous to late modern narratives that describe the present as thin and the time of human futurity as running out. So a maternal death drive would describe the unfolding of one life in relation to another life, in relation to one's own path towards death. So a capacity to tolerate repetition within the thin present in the name of futurity, perhaps of a life that is other than your own. So to approach repair through a politics of repetition, I think makes the difference that breaks open the monolithic qualities of what Charles Mills has called white time and allows us to open a time that is supplementary to the interminable oscillation between destruction and repair. And that brings me to a second movement towards care of the possible, which has to do with collectivizing these temporal practices. I see repair as a practice of thought that is radically open to all. To know and to go on knowing about the damage we do is a certain kind of epistemological work that entails going on knowing about situated histories and memories of violence, as well as repair itself as disruptive of thought in its productive or retentive modes. And I find Christophe de Jure's distinction between production and work useful here. Capitalism invisibilizes working in relation to production. Working, however, is only possible for a body capable of suffering and is always a form of cooperation with others. To work, which is to suffer, is to live together. The work of repair, then, is a non-productive mode of thought, open to all, given that all bodies are open to wounding, to violence, and therefore to suffering. As I see it, repair becomes a psychosocial economy through which we reconfigure work, labor, production, and suffering in careful, temporal, and non-productive terms. I'm sorry this is not as funny and fun as Mel's talk. It's a bit grim. <laughs> so what have we put in play so far? Sorry, that's my maternal death drive. That was some quotes about the death drive. <laughs> and just to pull together now, what we have in play is time in its racialized, its gendered, its class dimensions, care, maintenance, repair, destruction, violence, wounding, the suffering body, non-productive modes of thought, and working together. And I hope you're at least picking up where we're going in terms of thinking about Mel's work. Christina Sharp, in her account, in her book, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, develops the wake as a term that holds together the path behind a ship, keeping watch with the dead, and the process of coming to consciousness in the sense of wakefulness. So the ship, the dead, and consciousness coalesce in her work around what Sadia Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery and its relation to black life in the diaspora. And Sharp talks about living in the wake as a permanent and global condition of living the disastrous time, she says, of ongoing imperialisms and colonialisms, the aftermath of this period we call modernity. The task, as she sees it, for black thought and for thinking itself is to remain in the wake, to occupy what she names as its infinitive grammar of being, in order to both inhabit and rupture it. So for Sharp, this is a mode of care that attends to the afterlife of the past as it refuses to pass. Care understood through Sharp's figure of the wake becomes a problem for thought so much so that thinking and care need to stay in the wake. Just as queer thought has embraced arrested non-developmental time as a way to disrupt normative timelines, and feminist thought has long advocated the theorizing of the repetitive, laborious time of social reproduction, so what Sharp calls black non-being in the world is what calls thought to rethink itself as a mode of care. 
And these are all theoretical articulations of what I've called in Enduring Time, unbecoming time. So time that pools without a rim. And this image comes from Denise Riley's work, Time Lived Without Its Flow. And this is the quotation from the beginning of the book, which is a meditation on the sudden arresting of time that follows the death of her adult son. She says, a sudden death for the one left behind does such violence to the experienced flow of time that it stops and then slowly wells up into a large pool instead of the old line of forward time now something like a globe holds you you live inside a great circle with no rim so this is not stopped time it's not deadened time it's not timelessness in Freud's sense of Zeitlos it's something like time suspension. Time, like a viscous fluid, takes on a different form, no longer a line with direction or purpose, but a pool that wells up in present time that will not pass and has no rim. So suspended time allows the seeping of the materiality of time into consciousness. It pools like a great pocket of blood that both holds and suspends time as motion. So I've been preoccupied with this question. If time can be lived without its flow, then what can that kind of time, suspended time, tell us about how we are currently living time in a period supposedly of polycrisis? Ah, yeah, are people struggling to hear? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Okay, is this better now? No. No. <laughs> second, please. Yeah. And now? Yeah, it's better, yeah? Okay, good. All right. How much did you follow so far? <laughs> okay. All right, I'll speed up anyway. All right, so I'm just thinking about this question. Has something happened to time? If it has if time itself is in a kind of suspension at the moment, and we can think about what that means, what does that mean about care? And if living in such a time without its flow has something to do with persistent attachments to others, including those who are dead, a principle, if you like, of non-severance from what sustains ourselves, others, and infrastructures, then what might suspended time tell us about care and our capacities for caring on when time has pooled. So that's been a question that's preoccupied me for a while. And in Enduring Time, I turned to Merle's work as a way to try to think that question through. So that principle of non-severance of selves from others, from the self itself, and from institutions, from what sustains them, is completely at the center of this remarkable, elongated life work that Merle has just presented to us. So I won't go into too much detail because actually she gave us quite a lot of detail about the manifesto and about touch, manif uh, touch sanitation, which I was going to speak about. But briefly, I just want to think about that manifesto, maintenance, uh, manifesto for Maintenance Art 1969 proposal for an exhibition care as something to do with proposing a, a, a kind of temporal way for understanding maintenance. So maintenance takes on, I would say, two temporal forms. In part, maintenance is about trying to keep something going. So keeping things going, functioning, or in a steady state, or allowing what already exists to continue or persevere or carry on being. So it's not the time of generation or production or the eruption of the new. It's not revolutionary time, but it's the lateral time of on go or carrying on, staying alongside, caring on, that tries to sustain an elongated presence. We maintain machinery, a political position, our lives and the lives of others, our composure, occasionally, our precarious mental states. Maintenance is a bulwark against the time of entropy and the propensity of all living systems to decay and eventually die. So maintenance requires an attachment to now time that is not so much the time of the Benjaminian flash, but of the slow burn of one moment looking very much like another. But secondly, to maintain is also to keep buoyant. To maintain one's mood could be described as buoying oneself up 
I don't know if that translates well into German, actually. But a kind of keeping afloat, keeping oneself or someone else afloat during difficult times, maintaining that human activity is in fact having a disastrous impact on the planet's climate and ecosystems, is about upholding an idea, defending and affirming it when it's challenged or attacked. So to maintain is to underpin or prop up from below, to hold up when something or someone is flagging. So the time of maintenance is at the intersection between the lateral axis of stumbling blindly on and the vertical axis of holding up, orientating ourselves towards the future, even when that future is uncertain or may not be our own. So whilst there's an inherent conservative, even backwards impulse within maintenance practices, there are also temporal modes of maintenance that reach towards the future, even as they attempt to keep things the same as they ever were. And I think here we can glimpse the double action of maintenance as a material practice of sustaining people and things and connections, and the name for a paradoxical ongoing relation to attachment or the promise of time. Another way to put it is that maintenance is the temporal dimension of care, the disavowed durational activity that gives the lie to being as Conatus, Spinoza's supposedly innate inclination for things to go on being or to somehow enhance itself. Maintenance deals with states of dependency, with vulnerable states in which we're reliant on the practices and goodwill of other people, beings, things to survive and thrive. Vulnerabilities that emerge at different points in our individual histories as well as emerging differently in relation to histories of oppression and resistance and histories of power and agency. So Marl has told us that she was pregnant in 1969 and had been told by our art school that she could no longer be an artist. Prior to this, as I understand it, she'd been making artwork that involved wrapping and stuffing objects. But the objects seemed to need constant care and, as she put it, schlepping around. She was trying to free herself so as not to be tied down. So she tried massive inflatable airfield objects instead, with the idea she could fold them up and put them in her back pocket at the end of the exhibition. But sealing airfield objects is not easy. You need a heat sealing industrial process, and anyway, they kept leaking. So her attempt to function as an autonomous artist, free of material and ideological systems of reproduction, had failed. As a pregnant woman, she was caught with that simultaneous desire, as she told us, to mother and to make artwork. Cyril Connolly's famous remark, there is no more somber enemy of good art than the pram in the hall. It seems that this provided a kind of pressure point, an epiphany, a break in her thinking. Instead of trying to hide the maintenance work she was involved in so that she and the artwork could appear free and autonomous, she would make maintenance work itself into art. So this is just the top fragment of the um, manifesto that you'll see upstairs in the exhibition. It represents an attempt, I think, to think through the temporal practices of maintenance that underpin revolutionary change. It's not simply a call to overturn patriarchy, although it is that but it offers a critique of our very understandings of action and change. Parenting and maintenance in general, as the art critic Shannon Jackson has written, become the formal problem Eukalis is seeking to address. In the opening section, entitled Ideas, uh, Eukalis takes up Freud's distinction between death and life. Death, Eukalis associates with separation, individuality, liberation, the avant-garde, the capacity to do one's own thing, to follow one's own path to death. The death drive, in other words, is the marker of an autonomous life, free of dependencies and crucially free of others. Of the life instinct, on the other hand, she writes, unification, the eternal return, the perpetuation and maintenance of the species, survival systems and operations, equilibrium. So out of this distinction, Eukalis outlines two basic systems, those of development and maintenance. 
So development is linked to the pure individual creation, the new, change, progress, advance, excitement, flight or fleeing. And maintenance is the practice that underpins development, keep the dust off the pure individual creation, preserve the new, sustain the change, protect progress, defend and prolong the advance, renew the excitement, repeat the flight. So you'll see that all in the manifesto. So development, in other words, is utterly dependent on practices of preservation, prolongation, repetition, protection and sustenance, which we could summarise simply with the term dusting. Echoing earlier feminist debates about reproduction and domestic labour that Simone de Beauvoir had begun and Hannah Arendt had taken up. Where development systems include room for change, maintenance systems, she says, are dire, with little room for alteration. So section C of the manifesto, quote, maintenance is a drag, it takes all the fucking time. Brackets, literally. Having laid out those two systems, Eukalis then changes the direction of the drives. She deliberately realigns radicality, not with the assertion of autonomous parenthood, change, disruption, but with the habits of maintenance and care on which such autonomy is dependent. She asks not just for the recognition of the labour of maintenance, but for the efficacy of what she calls maintenance art, reversing the logic of the development maintenance system in realising that she, the artist, is the, is the only one who gets to define for herself what art is, she declares maintenance a viable form of art, making an intervention into the dichotomy between life and death. In other words, first she reverses the order so that life maintenance becomes dire rather than lively, and death art is the drive towards progress and liberation rather than deadliness. And then she flips the order, declaring maintenance a form of art. So in doing so, this maintenance, cooking, cleaning, washing, dusting, keeping the home fires burning, becomes a vehicle for revealing all the hidden life work that goes on on behalf of others, but without remarginalizing it, and crucially, without linking it to the time of progress. Instead, Eukalis opens up the temporality of what has been characterized by de Beauvoir and Arendt as female labor, to an association with liveliness through endurance, or reanimating the seemingly dead time of repetition and meaningless labour, but without linking it to development. So for me that's crucial, that's an example of the maternal death drive, if you like, at work. And then she connects that to the service workers who make up most of the workers of the world, as well as to the ailing social institutions, such as sanitation departments, arts funders, NGOs that support maintenance work, any art that claims to be autonomous is in fact, she says, infected by strains of maintenance, maintenance ideas, maintenance activities and maintenance materials. So her work as an artist is not to treat the infection, but to mine it for an understanding of the broad social, political and aesthetic implications of maintenance, taking seriously the relation between the world's invisibilised workers, the degraded object world we all produce and the degraded social systems and institutions designed to manage social waste. Mel's already described touch sanitation, this extraordinary uh, endurance project really that unfolds over many years in the New York sanitation department in which she personally shakes the hands of 8,500 uh, sanitation workers in this uh, performance called Handshake Ritual. But she also has described a, a whole series of other kinds of projects that, that sort of spun off from that, including the, the project of, of cleaning the names, uh, the bad names that um, Sandman were being called at that time. So I won't, I won't repeat it, what she said. I just want to think about two things. One is this, quest, this, this lovely idea about the performance itself being a kind of dance, so a kind of falling in step, as Patricia Phillips has described it, with the entire workforce of the city. So that flows of information, materials, desires, social relations and interpersonal resonances become part of the, of the public domain again, which seem to entail, as you saw, an intense practice of listening and a kind of tuning in to the rhythms and routines of an established workplace 
what Patricia Phillips calls its polychromatic communications. But I also want to think about the ways that this work now could be read as anachronistic. And for me, anachronism is always a positive term. I mean, municipal sanitation departments in most major cities in the global north have been outsourced to multinational corporations whose slow violence far outweighs that of the ailing social institutions that UK leaders were seeking to investigate and prop up in the 1970s. Companies like G4S, Serco, Veolia run cleaning services, we could say, as a cover for their work running prisons, secure units, detention centres, deportation centres, and in some cases extremely dubious work running infrastructure that supports the lives of illegal settlers in the occupied territories in Israel-Palestine. So those companies are deeply involved with cleaning and with security and many other things beside, but I think we need to think carefully about that relationship. Ukele's work also sits contextually within a long history of durational art practices that stage time and its relation to capital in perhaps more direct and overt ways. Yet I think what Ukele's work reveals is something about the quality of suspended time. Sort of scrubbed clean of irony, we witness her throwing herself at the city in a totally serious, engaged, rigorous and earnest way at work in the dead time of repetitious labour, cleaning, washing, walking, shaking, relating, caring. <laughs> Her aim is not simply to show up the relation between art and capital, or between domestic labour and the public sphere, but for she herself to re-suture the relation between degraded things, rubbish, the people who produce them, and those who handle them, sanitation workers. This means living in the impasse, in the wake, if you like, in order to reveal its qualities. The assumption that maintenance time is a literal waste of time is challenged by her tracking of waste and turning it and those hand who handle it back into discrete objects who command respect and recognition. This changes the time of public life by her constant reminder that public and domestic maintenance work are connected. More fundamentally, it reveals the temporal lives that are neither simply about survival, nor aimed at event, but are rather without project, as Simon Bailey has described it. Lives involved in labour that cannot be discreetly parcelled up into the project time that now organises most industrial and immaterial labour. Time, in other words, emerges from Ukele's work as the one thing we share, the potential that is for a life without project, a way of being in time that is not about going anywhere, and it's not about not going anywhere, but is perpetually concerned with what is produced, collected, transported and buried, like the rubbish, 365 days a year. And instead of trying to get away from such a life, that is to transform care work, or revolutionise it, or outsource it, or shift it elsewhere, or share it out even, she dwells in it and with it and touches it and shows us it is no longer dire, but keeps all productive systems going. There is no way to reveal this time other than to live it, to provide what she calls attentive reverence for each mote of dust. My final quote. Talking about another of her endurance works, Fresh Kills on Staten Island, once the largest landfill site in the world, which she partially sees as a process of disaggregating rubbish into the distinct objects that once came together to make it. She writes the following in 2002. So that's why in this 50 year old social sculpture we have all produced of four mountains made from 150 million cubic yards of the undifferentiated, unnamed, no value garbage whose every iota of material identity has been banished, the memorial, graveyard, or whatever it is, needs to be created out of an utterly oppos opposite kind of social contract. I've just skipped a bit there. Thus remembered, this must become a place that returns identity to, not strips identity from, each perished person. The lives that Eukalis reveals in touch sanitation are not lives that exist outside of structures of power, violence or capital, 
but her work provides a corrective to seeing that the only way of engaging with such structures is through the lens of agency, resilience, resistance, or the eruption of the event in relation to the object. Although she describes herself as a time traveller, time in Ukele's work is chronic and stuck and repetitive. But maintenance time points us towards the time involved in maintaining connections with one another, and hence, indeed, with the time that we share. So I suggested at the beginning that we might need to think about care of the possible, which is a question about how to take care of time, in that care recognises that betterment is not a time in the future, but the time we labour within in the now, in its repetitive, bleak and sometimes ugly forms. To grasp the time of care is to take the time that doesn't slip through our fingers, the sense that we're always running out of time, to take it as our time, our collective time, and to recognise that this is time, as a Gambon would have it, that we actually have. And that's the end of the talk. Lisa, thank you very, very much um, for following uh, on Oculus. And can you hear me? Yeah? OK, so I leave this for you. Um, hello, Marilo. So you're back with us. Um, <clears throat> so let's take the time we have. We have already spoken very long, but it's wonderful to listen to you both. Um, and maybe let's begin with um, one or two questions, and then I want to hand over to um, you, because I know there are many people in the audience here who have a lot to say, I'm sure, and, and questions to both of you. So um, in the beginning, I would like to maybe comment more than question. Um, what I find really striking is that both of you stress so much um, the collectivity um, within maintenance work and within also the stalled, stilled time of maintenance work. Um, Merle, you have um, called several times, I think, in your presentation for a grand coalition of the maintenance workers of the world. Um, and Lisa, you speak of non-severance, of which I think is a very beautiful formulation, a non-severance of selves and others and institutions from what sustains them. Um, and, and of care as the temporal practice of maintaining relations with others um, and a form of alongsidedness. And of course, Merle, your work you have shown to us um, is essentially about collaboration that you have described with different terms. Um, um, you also spoke of, um, while addressing the workers in touch sanitations, um, that you don't um, that, that you are not there to watch them, to study them, to judge them, but to be with them. So being with and also following uh, in the footsteps um, is also a form of alongsidedness. So um, <clears throat> I'm curious to you both, actually, if you can describe a little bit more your own working method, so to say, of non-severance um, and relationality in relation to your collaborators and or research subjects. So how, um, so what qualities of relations are you establishing concretely? In what sense can alongsidedness be understood as a form of care? I don't know who wants to start. Mala, maybe you start. No, no let she go, let us go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too long. Let, let, let her go. Okay. A few thoughts first, then, before we hand back to you, Mel. Um, it's a lovely question. Um, it depends what we mean by practice. So I suppose, first of all, there's a practice of thinking um, in which the attempt to bring alongside uh, concepts or ideas that might not just be incompatible, but have also become anachronistic, they've fallen out of time, mm -hmm. uh, is very interesting to me. So thinking with Michelle Serre about the idea of uh, very core ideas in one 
um, temporal era becoming sort of derelict, basically, in another, as they're supposedly superseded by other ideas, and what it might mean to sort of hold on to or store, restore a relationship with ideas that have fallen into disrepair. And so that's very interesting to me, and in, in the book I, I do some thinking about a particular psychoanalytic concept of um, psychic reality that becomes sort of useless at a certain point in psychoanalytic history, and then becomes usable again through its uptake in another discipline, and then is gifted back, if you like, to psychoanalysis to think with. So I'm sort of interested in anachronism and ideas, of I ideas that fall out of time. So that would be one practice, I suppose, of remaining alongside something that appears to be useless, basically, or waste. I guess as a, a clinical practice, um, there would be an interesting thing to think about, about whether there's a, any, ever any waste in an analytic session. You know, in some ways, uh, everything, the kinds of discipline that you saw, I saw Merle developing over time, kind of intense listening capacity, which doesn't answer the problems that the Sandmen often tell her, and they often say, do something. You know, are you going to do something? And there's an incredible sort of sense in which she embodies a kind of doing, <laughs> there and then with them, in terms of going on listening. And I relate to that very strongly in terms of analytic practice, where nothing is wasted. I mean, nothing is waste in terms of free association that is brought to the session. Everything is thought about in that sense of the absolute specificity of the moat of dust mm -hmm. that Merle told us about is what um, is gathered up in an, in an analytic way. So I suppose my analytic work I would think about in, in that way too. And thirdly, in terms of research, I mean, in the last five years I've been working with an amazing team of researchers developing co concepts and practices around waiting in relation to healthcare. So, um, the, the watchful waiting that goes on when we don't know what a symptom means yet or medication hasn't begun to work or therapeutic um, uh, work as a practice of waiting or end-of-life care, what it means to offer medical and health care in the period that we call dying. All of those kinds of um, things being thought about in a research team in which we've had to just wait with each other for over long periods of time in order for ideas to coalesce because when your object of study is waiting try and think about how to research something like waiting there probably isn't another way than to try to embody that in the research practice itself is that enough mm -hmm. now do you want to add something on this <laughs> i think i mean um that what you, what you just d described of um, that there is no waste, so to say, also in your practice, I find this quite um, adequate considering how you really literally uh, attempt, and of course it's, there's always an impossibility within this, but to be in touch with everybody. I mean, in the case of um, the touch sanitation performance, but also um, as far as I can tell from studying your archive quite extensively to really trying to be in touch with every single worker and, and within this vast um, um, operation of the touch sanitation department. Um, so there is also an interesting um, composition of scale, I think, because on the one hand you insist on this kind of very embodied personal a singular relationship, the touch that also appeared again and again in your presentation, but then you you um, yeah blow it up to scale. Um, I mean, from your very individual performances in the beginning, and then up to the sanitation department, the 8,500 workers, up to this last still unrealized proposal you made um, involving one million uh, citizens of New York City. So. Yeah, that's somehow, an in, to me, interesting um, and really unique um, approach to scale. Thank you. Mm. Good. I want to, well, a cheaper side, so much. Um, I must say that 
being invited to be part of the Great Repair Project, which was initiated by the uh, architecture design group that publishes Arch Plus magazine. I, I have never, in, as an artist, had the opportunity to feel so uh, at home anywhere um, that I have felt being invited into this massive rethinking uh, that, that the people, uh, this, our program today, that we're part of something, a something that I have never actually seen before in such a serious, prolonged, intense way. So I, I, pr I must say I'm personally so honored to, be, to have been invited by Patina to be part of this and then joined by other members of the whole um, editorial group that has produced this entire. Uh, and my ideas have, haven't been taken so seriously like Lisa with her gorgeous language. <laughs> And Bettina, who made this happen, um, so I'm, I'm just I'm thrilled. <laughs> Mel, we also all thrilled here, I think, and also in the room. Um, yeah, okay, go on. I, I just want I want to say something. Um, there are some cultural differences that I feel like I have to mention. Um, in, in America, in the United States, I don't know, uh, Lisa spoke about the, the hidden uh, structures behind many private uh, waste companies, that they're, they look like they're picking up the garbage, but really they're doing a lot of other quite unsavory um, evil things as well. Um, I don't. I don't have statistics, and I wish I did. Of uh, how many uh, sanitation departments uh, are extant, municipal part of a government? I think it may be less than that. They, they, they no, the opposite. They may still be more present as city. Um, sanitation department in the United States than in Europe. But I, I have to find that out. It's not my um, uh, understanding that they've all been bought up, sold off to private, to private companies. Um, I'm very happy that, in the, I think it's very, very important that the city keeps its sanitation department. Mm -hmm. Plus, it belongs to, we are all the owners of the sanitation department and all the producers, like producers, receivers, owners, it's whole and it represents all of us. Um, I don't think it should be sold off mm -hmm. as a, a part of capitalist society. Mm -hmm. um, so I, don't, I have to find that. If, but there's a word that's occurring to me among this flow of beautiful language today, and that is obliterate. Obliteration, not anachronistic, but obliteration. And that has to do with value. That what's stupid in a lot of Western systems is that it has ends up making people, cultures, 
obliterated. I, I, for so many years, I think to myself, why do sanitation workers feel so bad? Why, why do they feel? What ha What happens here? It's, it's so stupid. Why do women who become mothers end up feeling they're not seen or that people tell them who they are not asked? They don't get asked. There's an obliteration that happens that I ask myself forever, year in, year out, year in, year out. The stripping of value. I just—it's a—it's still a very open, open question. I think that I'm very happy to say that I would say in the New York Sanitation Department that 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 I think the job, the conditions that I was so critical of, have improved enormously, and that there's a—I think it's largely part from the civil rights movement and from the feminist movement that that there's a refusal of obliteration that has grown enormously. I also want to say that one more thing. Um, Mal to be Mal able to... Yeah. Do, I will just... To be a, a short, okay. To be able to do what I've done all these years the artist in re unpaid official artist in residence that that I I have been able to be an what they call in the Department of Cultural Affairs an ex inspiration for um, an, a pair program public artist in residence who that now exists in many many municipal departments and they get paid. I still don't get paid, and it's been very, very hard for me personally, because I, I don't, I don't come with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I have to raise it, and it's made a, a make ten times longer to get something done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for um, referencing also your own practice and the main and how to maintain your own practice over decades and decades and also how to maintain the um, inspiration to go on with these projects that in many cases, especially in relation to fresh kills and the landfill that you couldn't talk so extensively about in the end, but most of these projects that you have started to think about very, very early, like in the 70s, like the first elaborate uh, commission to make a proposal for the landfill was 81, and up to this day, still, um, none of these proposals have been realized, but you maintain um, a practice of still proposing and insisting. But I feel I would like to maybe um, open and see if there are questions in the room or comments or um, because yeah um, yeah for your talk and um, it was really inspiring to hear your work as someone who's worked with Grow NYC who had a lot of funding from the Department of Sanitation for their work in food scraps collections and I was curious if uh, questions around composting and biodegradable waste enters into your thoughts and practice at this stage, especially now as DSNY starts to uh, kind of take over within their own st uh, structure the collections of uh, food waste and now in Brooklyn and Queens and eventually for all of New York City. Thank you. Um, first of all, that uh, there, there are two phases of this uh, municipal composting ambition. When I was moving around to the, all the districts from um, 79, 80, uh, into the 80, early 80s, New York City had a, a, a fabulous composting uh, section of the department. Not the most popular one, not the most well-funded, 
but a very big one, and then it went away. So I'm I'm so hoping to uh, to see that ambition on their part of sanitation to get into food waste, which is a huge percentage of our waste that is most dumb. Talking about dumb things, to waste, to waste all this and not and not try to do it smart. Um, it's a great thing that's happening right now. Very hard, but we. I think I have no doubt we could do that. Any more questions from the room? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a small remark. I'm Magdalena Kallenberger, the mem uh, one member of Maternal Fantasies Collective an artist collective based here in Berlin. We are seven mother artists, 13 children, and we have deeply inhaled your work, Lisa. Like both of your books, as well as Spend the Time became the title of one of our short films, which traveled internationally. And Merle, your work, you became one of our aunts that we <laughs> took up when we built our legacy of feminist ancestors. And you started in 69 and now we have uh, 24. And I was just wondering why today here there is no childcare. Because, <laughs> yeah, I had to say that because I'm among with other friends, female <coughs> artists who didn't throw out their brain with the garbage. We came with our children, most of them left. And yeah, I wanted to raise that here. So there's still more work to be done always, that is clear. Um, okay, if I don't see any urgent... Ah, there is a, another hand rising. Um. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, at the beginning of your, your uh, artistic trajectory, you, you mentioned anger, the way you were angry uh, and, and decided to were spurred on to action. And um, I wanted to sort of get into a question a bit more uh, granular in, 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 um, in uh, quality, not so much the ethical questions. Um, you, it's interesting for me that your approach is so analog, that there was, uh, it's analog in nature, in quality, in methodology. You even say yourself at one point, I refuse the method of sampling. Um, it's only by immersing myself does it become real. Um, Today, we are faced with a digital triumphalism. Uh, the digital uh, 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 triumphalism, not only in business, but also in art, even among certain activists on the left. Um, so we are, have the social media, uh, project management, culture, software, et cetera, this idea that computers empower uh, users. Um, are you? ever angry at the way digital has displaced the analog or have you just moved on with that? Huh. Uh, when, I, when I came home after I got this idea to go shake hands with everyone, Jack, my husband, said, you're going to kill yourself. It's, you can't do that. He's a planner. His doctorate is in planning. And part of planning, I think, is heavily sampling. Always very digital, actually. And I said, First of all, I didn't have any money to do much else. I said, what can I do? I need to go do, see everybody. It's, it, it was more primitive, actually. Your question, I think, is, is this analog? I mean, analog is sort of a dirty word because it really, really, it's a, it's a thing that precedes digital. People in the analog age didn't call it analog. They just said that's the way things are, like records. Uh, plays. <laughs> so I don't know if I accept that characterization. Um, 
but there is something physical. I think it, it, come, it comes out of being an artist that how do I know how to do something? I, I learn, I do a lot of research and all, but, but there's something in me as an artist that I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And I often don't even understand it till it's over. Is that analog or digital? <laughs> Maybe it's also interesting to add. You know, digital, digital, the digital would be okay, except it makes me feel pretty stupid. <laughs> and I'm very, very dependent on people who are so cool, like Christopher sitting there, who make things happen, make things come out right. <laughs> um, there, I, I, I keep hoping there's something that I can do. I mean, I, I, I'm very happy that I have digital video of uh, that I was able to afford through getting some grants of sanitation to shoot seven days, and that's a record that I finally was able to edit several years later, and that's digital. And I'm, and, and, and people know the work through photographs and the work that is so physical and so full of touch. They know it through photographs and, um, and videos, c completely digital. Mm. So I, 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 don't have a, um, I don't have such a clear answer. I mean, maybe it's important to add that I think even, I mean, let's say if we look at waste and waste work, that um, despite the development and high technological facility in some mostly Western, uh, let's say, recycling facilities, a lot of waste work is still manual labor. And I, I see Absolutely. also, I mean, especially if we look um, at the global picture and um, at the um, vast externalization of waste. I mean, um, that's, uh, that's also another issue that we might need to address here. But um, I think it's really relevant to think about a, a lot of maintenance and care work um, in many fields that is still manual labor. And so I do see also really a relevance of your work and, and, and insistence on this kind of, um, yeah, what I have called touching numbers, because you're, you're so much insisting on really literally and not sampling, but touching everybody and everything. Um, and touching numbers is a very contradictory notion because touch is indeterminate. It is correlational, so it's always open to, um, yeah, also harm in some ways. Um, and, and, um, violence. and violence and numbers is this idea of um, rational determinate way of um, counting what matters but you oppose this idea that we can count what matters only through numbers and scales through a very embodied and um, singular touch and I think this is really um, very very important um, I wanted to add one um, thought about uh, what you said before, um, let's say the positive change that have also occurred within um, the operations of the sanitation department. I think it's also important maybe to reconsider that you entered the department at a time in the late 70s that was a time of um, paradigmatic shift in waste management internationally, especially in the West, many Western countries, um, where a lot of um, uh, ecological um, uh, regulations were introduced. But yes. um, so it was maybe also a time of, you could say, hope, um, because a lot of activism. Um, um, environmental justice activism particularly that was looking at the racist um, ma patterns of waste um, uh, disposal, they had an effect somehow. However, if so, so you entered the department in a time, maybe that's a bit simplistic, but and maybe in a time that was open for change and maybe open for some vision of betterment. However, if, if scholars now in this field of discard studies um, look at the development 
also maybe from a global perspective, which is always, of course, simplifying. But um, looking that at the same time when um, environmental regulations were introduced to waste management in many Western countries, at the same time the global waste, toxic waste trade and the, the scope and scale of waste externalization globally um, has occurred um, in parallel. So, um, yeah, so now I think reading a lot of this literature around um, in, in discard studies, it is sometimes also difficult to um, even yeah, maintain a vision of betterment when we see that all these many um, measures that have been introduced around recycling, etc., have had, from a global perspective, very, very little effect. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we look at specific waste streams, for instance, plastic waste streams, right? The plastic production since the 1950s until today have never uh, gone down. They have um, multiplied in an, uh, to a scale that is unimaginable. The only moments when there were any changes in plastic production were 1976, the oil crisis, and 2008, the financial crisis. These were the only moments when there was, let's look at it from a global perspective, when there was really a change in plastic production and therefore waste production. Um, so, yeah, there is, there is also this question maybe that is difficult to answer, I know, but how within this practice that you both describe of maintenance um, that is somehow both um, embedded in a kind of stilled time, uh, the time of repetitive um, working, um, how can this still be linked to change? Um, yeah, I know you have, you have elaborated a little bit about this, but I think you both have this very complex relationship between yeah, maintenance um, that is in a way, a practice um, that, yeah, requires, as Lisa, as you say, requires time of passing and a slow process of studies. Um, and also, Mel, you describe maintenance as um, something that provides little change. So how can we imagine change, uh, yeah, politics maybe, change uh, within this practice of maintenance? I know it's a big question, but um, yeah, there's a, we have to come to a close soon, unfortunately, but yeah, maybe you can still both say something about this. Okay, maybe first, yeah, <coughs> maybe you first uh, answer. Mm -hmm. Go on, you go first this time. No, okay. <laughs> Is this so, working? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I never know how to answer this question. It's, mm. it's a really difficult question. I, I think, so one way to answer it, I suppose, for me is to go back to the analytic clinic, actually. You know, in the, in the reality of a global mental health crisis, what is the point of an, an, of, of an individual analysis? Yeah? How can one possibly stem the... In a way, this is how you framed it, yes? Mm. In the reality of um, the escalation of waste and mm -hmm. the impossibility at the moment, as it feels, to, to make any substantive change, what is the point of an artist going into New York sanitation department and trying to instigate, mm. in a very small way, a practice of trying to pay attention to every mote of dust? And the only answer to that question is to say that is exactly the thing that you have to do. Yeah, there mm. isn't another way around, I don't think. The need to do exactly what Merle's doing, which is to say without differentiating, without revaluing, yeah, in the way that she does to disaggregate the, disaggregate the devalued from something that then can be revalued or resutured to the question of value, then we, we have no, what, what is it exactly one is trying to achieve? Mm. So for me, actually, it's extremely valuable, the artistic work that Mel does, because it literally causes us to refocus our attention on every mode of dust. Mm. Mm. The, um, 
that, that what I learned uh, after being around um, people at all levels in the sanitation department for years is that there's an uh, understanding and an, an understanding inside and outside, which is different. That, that it, a very sensitive people know who are great workers inside. They know how valuable they are individually, how much they accomplish inside. They know how, how they're fighting against the chaos of garbage. They count every ounce of waste. It's hysterical. The sanitation department counts. You know, in Sesame Street, and then there's count, count. They count everything. Everything. Why? Because there's this kind of chaos. And unless you start instilling systems of measurement, it can run away with you. However, what Bettina brings up, I think, a very, very important is jumping scales, mm -hmm. which she did about plastic waste, which could destroy all of us, I think. Um, the amounts of waste in the, in the ocean and how small, many heroic efforts there are in dealing, collecting, but not not down to the motes of dust, which are the micro pieces of plastic that now live in our bodies. That's a different kind of moat. The scale of that, talking about scale, it's real, very important to talk about scale. I think what, what, I, what I felt is this anger. I, look at I went to very fine schools, and I, and I was spoken to in a certain way, and I had full expectations to be a very powerful person, able to have agency in my culture. And, and yet many people that I met when I had the three children that got tripled was that they didn't ask me anything. That's what pissed me off the most. They had nothing to ask, as if I have nothing to say. And I thought, this is so stupid. And when I'm around sanitation workers who I see handle, handle incredible what they call conditions, like really unexpected chaotic situations, a truck flips over, someone is hit often by, by uh, other drivers, that how they handle things with such courage and bravery um, so that that inside, outside, it could make you very upset. And that was a common, very firm ground um, that, that enabled me, if I listened enough, because I heard from inside of myself, why doesn't anyone have anything to ask me? Um, that, 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 that common anger, I think, is something that can be built on, whether it can deal with issues of such stupendous scale that the team was, is ta focusing on, the global north and the global south, vast differences, vast levels of toxicity, that are not regulated in the global south. Um, those, those issues, they are really scary. So staying with the anger in some way and um, continuing Absolutely. to listening. Um, Absolutely. Are recommendations maybe from your side to um, come to a close. I get several signs here again and again that we have, unfortunately, although we stress all of us so much that um, we refuse the ending, but I think still we have to end right now. 
Mal, um, but we'll fall off the edge, <laughs> the rim. <laughs> we'll fall over the rim. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so very much. And thank you, Lisa. Thank you to both of you really sharing your time and thoughts here. Um, and to this lively audience um, to be with us. I'm really, really very happy. And I think we will have also documentation of this talk. And hopefully, at some point, not in the very far future, we will be able to come together really in person and continue working on or, or working in the spirit of many of your proposals and continue them um, in some form. Um, so that would be nice. Good idea. Yes. Good idea, Patrice. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>